Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Wig Town Book Festival and to this particular event, which has been kindly supported by Ivy Fisher and Rebecca Giblin. I'd also like to extend uh, to our online audience a warm welcome to and a reminder that that is, of course, a free uh, event online, um, but if you have enjoyed it, um, perhaps you might consider a small donation to keep this, uh, these events Or a large pitch. donation if you'd like as well. <laughs> or a large donation, <laughs> and who can refuse? Um, every four years, the world of rugby prepares for one of the greatest challenges in sport. No, not the World Cup, the tour of the British and Irish Lions. But how does a rugby phenomenon born in the amateur age of the game more than 100 years ago. How does it continue to fascinate in the flint-edged professional 21st century rugby world that we currently live in? Well, a clue, and many clues, can be found in the book, The Legacy of the Lions. It's a fascinating book where many of the greats of the game expound on their experiences and the lessons learned from playing test rugby at the elite level. The author is himself, of course, a rugby legend. He is former captain of Scotland, former captain of the British and Irish Lions, and someone who has experienced both victory and defeat in a test series uh, down under. He is, of course, Big Gav. He is Gavin Hastings. Please welcome him to the book. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Gavin, welcome. First time in this part of the world. Uh, yeah, as far as uh, coming to Wigton is concerned, so delighted to be here and um, it's nice that uh, you're all here. I hope you have an enjoyable afternoon. I hope uh, you, you learn a wee bit more maybe about the Lions. Um, mm -hmm. I've not been drinking this afternoon, so I won't be able to tell quite so many stories uh, <laughs> in as lucid a form perhaps as sometimes I do, but uh, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, it was a great journey over from the other side of Scotland. It's quite a long way as well. <laughs> and now in the book, you quote uh, one of the former Lions um, coaches, Graham Henry. He's quoted as saying, you can count on, your, on two fingers the things that matter to him in rugby. They are the Lions and the All Blacks. <laughs> <laughs> it's an indication, isn't it, of just how important the, the tour of the Lions is. Why do you think it still holds that fascination? Yeah, it, it's an extraordinary thing, really, because it, in every respect, uh, almost the Lions is set up to fail. Um, every four years, you start from scratch, you name a squad of 30 players or 35 players, and the previous game they played was four years earlier. And you've got new coaches, you've got new management team, you've got clearly different players from the, the, those that went on, on the previous tour. And you have a matter of days, really, to prepare for this game against one of the giants of the Southern Hemisphere, and who have been playing all, all throughout the previous four, 12, eight, 100 years. And the Lions changes um, form every four years. So that's the greatest challenge. And never mind that you go to Australia one year, you're going to South Africa the next time, and, and four years after that, you're, you're going to New Zealand. So that's the extraordinary thing, really, I, I think, about the Lions, is that it's always evolving, and you're almost starting from scratch every successive four years. And that's why I was so keen, in, in many respects, to do... Uh, a book about what makes the Lions so special. And originally I thought that I would go back to 1971 um, and, and obviously the time that, that the Lions and some people in, in this hall will, will remember that. But uh, these games, uh, 1974, I think, to South Africa, the games weren't even shown on television back here in the UK and people would get up in the middle of the well, it wouldn't have been in the middle of the night when it was South Africa, obviously, but they'd, they'd be beside the radios and listening to the scores. And, um, you know, it was, it was amazing. And then I thought, well, it's probably for a, a more recent generation, 71, 74. Most people can remember back to 97. And I thought, but I didn't play in 97, so we better go back to when I started playing because I was the author. 
So that felt like the right time to start. So <laughs> I started with Finlay Calder, the captaincy, yep, in 1989. And we'll, and, uh, we'll come on to that in a second. But I just wanted to now this thing. I mean, it is important from our perspective, but it's even more important, isn't it, from the Aussies' point of view, from the South Africans. They seem to have this great thing about why is that? Is it the money, the, the, <laughs> the prestige? Well, I think um, it is an extraordinary... Um, yeah, aspect to, to rugby that, that really they, they view the Lions Tour as, as certainly the most important thing that comes to their country out with the Rugby World Cup. And, uh, you know, that's born out of history and tradition, particularly in South Africa and New Zealand. And I think uh, we've obviously been touring to Australia since 1989, and uh, the Aussies are always amazingly competitive. And um, they, they try their damnedest to, to beat the Lions. And everyone obviously loves to beat the Lions, but what I personally love about the Lions is the fact that 20, 25,000 people from these shores go down unashamedly and just with this passion to support not England, not Scotland, not Ireland and Wales, but the British and Irish Lions. And they all buy into the team by buying the, the, the shirts and the track suits. And, and the red is a, is a fantastically strong color. Um, and when you have the contrast, particularly against New Zealand, I think the black and the red, it is just epic. And unfortunately, um, the book, um, my publisher was keen to get the book out during this, uh, this summer and just prior to the Lions tour. What I'm keen to do now is, is hopefully be able to in interview Alan Wynne-Jones and um, work out how somehow he got back from damaging his shoulder mm -hmm and being in South Africa a few weeks later, because I still don't know how it happened. It seemed to be a minor miracle that he was able to play in, in the test matches. Do you think um, he wasn't as injured, perhaps, as we thought? Or was, <laughs> it, was there tactics I don't going think, on here? I don't think that was a conspiracy <laughs> uh, theory. No, I, I'm not sure that was according to plan. Everyone, but given everything else that happened on that tour, well, you, yeah, you might be... Was, <laughs> but, but, you know, I think you look back now, and, and the one thing for me that unquestionably was missing on, on this Lions tour that's just gone was the crowd. And, and have, Has there been people in the audience that have been in a Lions tour? Hands up. One. Only one. Was it good for you, sir? It was very good. You enjoy it. It was nice to be in there. Oh. Uh, well, you were one of the few, so thank you for coming. Oh, did you see yeah. that one under, was it under the post? Under the post, Under yeah. the post. Yeah, yeah. that I dropped. <laughs> yeah. oh, you'd have seen that one. <laughs> but still. Um, but, yeah. but if anyone was ever thinking of going on a Lions tour, let me just say that... Uh, you know, it would be amongst the best things that you would be able to do. And I think you would echo those words. It's mm. just, you, you know, people come from all corners of, of Great Britain and, and Northern Ireland and, and indeed Ireland as well. And, and you just make friends for life mm. because you're there just for this common theme of supporting the Lions. And it's pretty epic. And there's a soul about it, isn't there, as well? And this, uh, the, 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 we've talked about how the South Africans, the Aussies and, and the New Zealanders look upon it. I wonder if you'd read that bit. There's a, there's a story, a lovely story, which kind of epitomises what you've been talking about. That, that yeah, story. I'll do that. Um, um, it's one thing that I was keen to do was not only get a view um, from England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales and, and the people I interviewed, but I also thought it was very, very important to interview some captains from Australia, from South Africa, from uh, New Zealand. And this particular uh, guy, I spoke to a chap, John Schmidt, who um, captained the Lions in 2000, uh, sorry, captained South Africa against the Lions in 2009. And what I hadn't appreciated is 12 years before, in 1997, which is obviously a famous, famous tour, um, he uh, was a very young chap. So if I can just maybe read for three or four minutes about this, um, even though Natal were unable to field their South African internationalists. They were stable, still able to select seven internationalists, along with a number of players who would be capped in the near future. Among these was a, a young tight head who had just be, made his breakthrough into the senior squad. John Schmidt was 18 years old and wasn't long out of Pretoria Boys High School. Despite spending much of his life in the high veld, he was a dyed-in-the-wool shark supporter and was living the dream in his first year as a pro at the province. Schmidt had made his Sharks debut off the bench against Western Province a week before the Lions rolled into town. 
It had not gone particularly well. As he recalled when we chatted over Zoom, I had my arse handed to me by Gary Pagel. Robbie Kempson was suspended for the game and Ian McIntosh, the Natal coach, started Dave Morkel and I, and I got called up to the bench. The following week, we played the Lions and Robbie was back in the team. But for some inexplicable reason, Ian McIntosh dropped Dave from the squad and kept me on the bench. It was a hot, humid afternoon in Durban with a light breeze blowing in off the Indian Ocean. Deep in the bowels of Kings Park, Schmidt sat on the bench in the Starks changing room and looked at the jersey in his hand. I couldn't believe I was there, he says wist wistfully. I was on the bench against the Lions. The Lions! I looked around my changing room and I could see our captain, John Allen, about to play his last game for the province, literally steaming as he prepared to go out and play. This was such a huge, huge match. We were about to face the team that was pretty much the Lions test side that was going to face the Springboks in Cape Town a week later. We wanted to bloody their noses before the series and make a bit of history by beating them. They wanted to stamp some authority and show they were ready for the test. The atmosphere was incredible. I looked at their pack. Tom Smith, Keith Wood, Di Young, Martin Johnson, Simon Shaw, Lawrence Delalio, Richard Hill, Eric Miller. Jeez, what a team. If I came on, it would either, I'd either be scrummaging against Tom Smith or Jason Leonard, who was on the bench. I was absolutely shitting myself. <laughs> I'm just going to um, come through. Um, the game would finish 42-12 to the Lions, and Schmidt only has the odd flash of memory of these final few minutes when he came on. So fast did they pass. But he still remembers the huge swell of pride that washed through him as he returned to the changing room. I remember sitting there in my jersey afterwards and not wanting to take it off. It had been such a special experience. I hadn't been able to keep my first jersey because you only get your jersey after the season ends and I hadn't played enough games to earn it. But this jersey was a one-off with a special Natal Sharks stroke British and Irish Lions emblem embroidered on the sleeve and it was mine to keep. Then I looked up because Ian McIntosh was calling my name. He was by the door with Di Young who wandered over to me. Well played, he said. Do you want to swap shirts? I remember feeling a little sick. All around me, the other lions were starting to file in to swap shirts, but I was desperate to hold on to mine. I'm so sorry, I said. I'd love to swap, but I've been dreaming about playing for the Sharks my whole life, and I get to keep this jersey. I'm not sure if I'll ever get another one. He looked at me kind of perplexed and then said, hey, no problem, shook my hand and headed back to the change room. About five minutes later, there was another shout for me and McIntosh. I looked up again, and this time, it's Jason Leonard at the door. I go over to Jason, and he says, I heard about what you said to die. Listen, I want you to have my shirt, and we don't need to swap. I just want you to remember this day. I'm sure you go on to have a great career, but you're right to keep that jersey. It's special. Good luck. I'm sure you're going to go on and play many times for the box. And then he left. I've been playing rugby since I was a kid and I never really realised the power of rugby until that moment. Jason really showed me what rugby is, much more than anything that had ever happened on the field. The Lions smashed us this day and they ended up beating South Africa in the series and I couldn't help but be gutted by those results. But I was also happy for the Lions team because they'd come down to South Africa and played some amazing rugby. After, um, those moments haunted South Africa for 12 years. But I was also happy for that team that they achieved the series win. That shirt of Jason's has always been very, very precious to me. And I think in those few words, it sort of sums up what rugby is all about, I think, and, and, and just the sort of special understanding that Jason had for his opposite man, even though he'd just come on the field for 10 minutes. And that stayed with a guy who was 18 years of age. He then went on to captain South Africa to World Cup victory in 2007, as well as lead the Springboks to victory against the Lions 12 years after this match. So it was one of the nice little stories mm, from the book, I Absolutely. Think. I want to take you forward to, uh, we, we've already mentioned the, the 93 uh, tour, but I was going to mention um, the, 
something about explaining to perhaps those of us who are not aficionados of rugby of how the Lions works in terms of the midweek, the Saturday team, why that's important, because part of this book is about lessons learned, and there's a recurring theme here, isn't there? <laughs> Can you explain? Yeah, so I've already talked about, um, you know, every four years the Lions are effectively starting from scratch, and when you get together, there's a massive nervousness, and, and some of the, particularly going back, you know, to when I first played, and the majority of the guys playing for their respective countries would live in, in those countries. And so unless you played in the Five Nations, as it was then, and played for a number of years, you would basically hardly know the guys that you were going on tour with. So. In 1989, we all got together in, in a hotel in, in Weybridge, and um, the first couple of days, we go along to the pub. And it's amazing that once you get a couple of beers in your hand, that you start speaking, and, and you just find out a bit more about um, you know, your colleagues and your teammates and whatever else. But I think what you're alluding to is that this seems to be a recurring theme throughout the book. Well, and every chapter, I every think, <laughs> they talk to it, says, so, and then there was a piss-up. <laughs> And but, this is team bonding. But it's interesting. <laughs> and, and I always, when I started off and interviewed every single captain since 1989 and a lot of the players as well, and, and I didn't know what they were going to say, but without question and, or without uh, almost unconditionally, each of the captains said, you know, the greatest thing that we did was actually go to the pub for two or three times. And it's extraordinary, really, when you think about these great leaders and, and whatever else. You wonder whether Winston Churchill took his cabinet to the pub all the time or did they just drink his champagne and smoke his cigars at the same time. But, you know, for me, when I've listened to great leaders speaking, they've, they've basically made things sound so simple and, and so easy and so easy for people in the audience to understand. And there's nothing complicated about it. And... Therefore, why should it be complicated? Because ultimately, what makes it a great team, whether it's in sport or business, is being able to communicate, I think, with, with one another. And if, by the virtue of the fact that going to the pub, and, you know, not any, everyone in, in the Lions would, would drink. I mean, we, I always remember Rory Underwood. He's never really had alcohol, not because... He, he just doesn't like it, and... Mm. and you know, back in the day, people used to say that, that uh, Rory Underwood, he, he didn't draw, drink, he didn't smoke, and they would never chat to, to people of the opposite sex when we were on tour. And the rest of us thought, was it really worth it? Um, <laughs> but Rory's a lovely guy, and, and um, you know, we, we, it doesn't matter that folk don't drink. As long as they come to the pub, they can have a coat. And that's what it's all about, because I think people sort of unwind when they're in there. They know that a pub is a place that is for relaxation and, and for unwinding. And, and hmm. therefore, if you do get to know people a wee bit better, when you're in the heat of battle, and I would always, um, I, I guess I talked about this going into being captain in 1993, that I remember being captain of Scotland at the start of this year, and knowing that the Lions tour was only after a few games in the, in the Five Nations. And I, I set myself an ambition. I think, you know, when you're a kid and, you know, seeing this man with his broken arm, would you like to play for Scotland one day, young man? Yeah, 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 yeah maybe, maybe. Well, good luck. Um, and, um, but, you know, when I was a young man and, and went to Murrayfield for the first time with my dad, and I just thought, wouldn't this be amazing? And you never, ever thought about captaining your country. But as soon as I was made captain of, of Scotland, I wanted to put myself forward to be captain of the Lions, which was going to happen in a few months' time. And Will Carling was going to be the automatic choice for captaincy. And I thought, well, unless a few of us step up, you never know if you're going to get the, the, the right person for the job or not. And I felt my job as captain of Scotland was to clearly have the best season that we could possibly have and show that I was capable of being, um, hopefully, a good leader. And um, How did you get the call-up? You know, have you read to be the book? Captain. You know, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, you know. But you... I'll, yeah. I'll, tell, us, tell us about the It is call. quite... I mean, it's interesting. Um, Ian McGeechan was the coach um, of the Lions in 1993, and I'd had a few games as captain of Scotland, and 
They were meeting on the Sunday after the last round of Five Nations games, and Scotland weren't playing that last weekend. We'd finished um, the, the penultimate weekend because we played all our games consecutively. And um, Ian McGeechan had, had, was in his uh, meeting. And, and back then, um, there were a whole lot of selectors, um, one from England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, as well as the coaches. And uh, they were sitting in a room, I, I guess, down in, in England somewhere, and the phone rang on the Sunday evening. I was with my wife and um, we were just watching television and the phone rang and I, I went to get the phone. And Gavin said, I picked it up and, and uh, I said, hello. And he said, Gavin, it's, it's Ian McGeechan here. I said, Geech, how are you? He said, you're actually on loudspeaker. Um, I'm in the selection meeting, but I've been asked to ask you by the selectors in the room um, whether if you were offered the captaincy for the Lions Tour in 1993, i.e. in a few weeks' time, would you accept it? I said, Geech, how long have we known each other? And he said, probably about 12 years. I said, you know the answer to the question. And I put the phone down. <laughs> and literally, and I thought, oh, okay. I, I don't know if that was a ballsy move or not. Yeah, I was going to say. So <laughs> about an hour later, the phone rang. I thought, oh, I'll go and get the phone again. Uh, and it was Geech, and he asked me the same question. I said, we've already had this conversation, and I put the phone down. And um, about 20 minutes later, he phoned me back up. He said, congratulations, you're, you're going to be named as the captain of the British and Irish Lions. I said, I wondered when you were going to phone and tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I you didn't put the phone that. down then, I did you? I didn't put the phone down then. <laughs> but it was quite... And I just... And I, when I was interviewing Geech um, for the book, and we, we did all the calls on Zoom and we recorded them all. And uh, I said, Geech, that was my recollection. I've never really talked to him about it. I said, is that what happened? And he said, it was. And he said, the most remarkable thing about that, that particular tour was that because they had a selector from England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales, they were all trying to punt their guys from their own country. And... It was a bit of a disjointed selection. There was a guy, Jeff Probin, that was, should have gone on tour. He was left out. There were one or two players that, that perhaps with hindsight wouldn't have gone um, on tour. And he said there was so much horse trading that was going on in that thing. And, and when Geech told me that in, in the book, I actually was quite appalled because I know in the past, and, and maybe some Scottish people have been upset at the lack of, of Scots or numbers of Scots that are on the tour, but... You know, for my mind, it's not about how many representatives you have from each of the four home nations. It's about what the Lions do, because it's all about the Lions, and it has to be all about the Lions. That's and, still an issue, then, I know, amongst fans now. When you read the comments, there's, you know, well, why aren't they taking the guts of the Welsh team? They've won, and, and whatever. There's still that rivalry amongst fans, but you don't kind of appreciate that it was part of the system then. And that system has changed, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think Gage, um when he was asked to, to be the coach um, four years later, in 97, and he said he'll do it on one condition, that I can name my fellow coaches and we will, will um, determine the squad. And um, I think, you know, looking back to 93, it was probably the only time in that, in the period of the book that um, the, the squad has effectively been picked by selectors. And, uh, you know, that is a part of me that it's kind of grates with me because that might have been the difference between winning and losing. And mm. interestingly, I was with Gregor Townsend and Steve Tandy, who was the defence coach a few weeks ago. And uh, he sort of said, uh, Gregor and, and Steve, they both sort of said, yeah, that not winning the test series will stay with us for a good few months. And I said, it'll be a damn sight longer than that, <laughs> let me tell you. You'll be remembering this for the rest of your life, I'm afraid. I mean, the book and is uh, packed full of lessons that you can, you can learn reading between the lines and reading the accounts. Um, but one of the other lessons, apart from the selection issue, which uh, I was alluding to earlier, was this difference, that the fact there are two teams in effect, aren't there? Yeah, sorry. I, I knew I didn't answer your question No, no, that's fine. That, so, yeah. <laughs> I'm quite good at that. <laughs> um, well, it, it's interesting. I mean, you know, the first two tours I went on, we, we had 13 matches, um, and now there's only eight matches. And essentially, they've reduced, they've um, 
removed the two midweek games leading into the first test and the second test. And, and that's what's reduced it from 10 matches where it has been the last couple of tours to eight matches. Now, um, I sit in the British and Irish board as a former player alongside Jason Leonard, who was uh, the manager of this tour. Um, Yian Evans has just come on, who was on both my tours as well as in 97. And an Irishman uh, by the name of Tom Grace, who has been on the board for a long, long time. He's in his 70s, and, and I, I think it's probably he will be replaced at some stage, hopefully in, in, in the nearest future, because, you know, with respect, I think they need to bring a younger Irish guy on board. And, um, and then the four CEOs of each of the, the four home unions uh, sit on the board, mm. and then there's a couple of execs, two or three execs as well. But in terms of the midweek team, and I think you call them, is it the dirt track? I was stuff? coming to that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We've got an hour. We've got an hour. Fair enough. I was coming to it. Never yeah. push, Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I think, so what happens is that, that you know, now there's so much um, pressure being brought to bear on playing playing time and, and, and having rest for the players. And we were almost forced, in a way, for, to reduce the number of games that the Lions played. And what's happened, so back in the day, they used to, you know, you would fall into playing. Traditionally, the Lions would always play the more, the harder sides on the weekend, because obviously that's when the, the test matches were, and you work all the way back to the start of the tour. And then... You know, with the shorter tours, it becomes much harder to, to have the traditional, the Wednesday guys, which are, uh, who are known as the dirt trackers, and then um, the Saturday team, which in effect then becomes the test side to play the, the, the test matches. But when, you're sh when you've got this much shorter tour, you know, back in the day, you used to play 10 games, 12 games before the first test match, and then you'd have a break of about three or four weeks, so you'd still be able to play. And the team would evolve all this time. But now they've almost got to, the coaches, I think, have to go down with an idea of, of what the test team might be. So with, with five pre-test um, matches, we started on a Saturday, and we went Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. So effectively, you had five matches before you needed to pick your test side. But if the, you start with a midweek side and you go Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, and this Wednesday is the Wednesday before the first test, then you've only really got three games or most four games before your first test to get. And there's no time to prepare the team. So I think this whole situation, and there were guys on the tour that, that wouldn't have played for, you know, three or four weeks um, by the end of the tour, and it must have been so difficult. So one thing that I'm going to try and do is, is see whether we can reinstate some of the midweek games because it's very, very difficult for the guys to have not played for three or four weeks. And Finn, Finn Russell came in. He hadn't played for four weeks, and he came in off the bench on that last game, and he had such a remarkable impact on, on the team's performance, and, and it was an astonishing but isn't there a danger that if you're playing midweek, you kind of were, you know, there's almost like two teams. There's a midweek team and you're probably not going to play in the test or, you know, well, sort that, of, and the division, the potential for division there is there, yeah, isn't it? You're right. And, and the whole essence of this book, I suppose I was very, very keen to understand why or how, why and how some tours are, are successful and, and other tours are not. And I compare my two um, tours in 89, which was successful, to 93, which was nearly successful. And, and I can only rationalise that by, um, there was a chap in 89, Donald Lenehan, an Irish second row, and he galvanised the midweek side. And people were, were very, very keen to play for Donald. His team were called Donald's Donuts. And, and the, he had the dirt trackers. And he just, he knew he was not quite good enough to play in the test side. So he took responsibility. But Finn was such a great captain, Finlay Calder, that he somehow managed to, you know, just galvanise everybody. And, and there was just this... Because when you get it right, the midweek side, that they're very, very keen to keep the pressure on the Saturday side and 
keep the performances up and they put the pressure on because they know if the guys fall off the perch a little bit at the weekend that the Wednesday side, some of the guys can make it into the Saturday side. And that's the challenge that you have. You talk and, about um, um, uh, successful and less successful tours, shall we put it that way. Um, 2005, I think we've got to talk about that. That was, what, the largest, the, a huge Lions tour. And it was a bit of a disaster, really, wasn't it? Well, it was. Take and, us and, back. And, um, well, Sir Clive Woodward was in charge of, of that tour. And, you know, I think um, Clive had, had tried to replicate what made the England squad so successful that won the World Cup in 2003. But that sort of thing, you know, these guys had trained all the time for seven or eight years almost, leading into 2003. Massive experience. And, and what I've talked about before is that, that guys have to get to know each other within a very short space of time. And in 2005, he had everyone not sharing a room. They, they were all in their own individual rooms. And he effectively picked two squads, a midweek, a squad to play the midweek game, with their own coaches, including Ian McGeechan, and then a Saturday team that that um, basically trained together, and, and and both squads were separate. Now that's not what the Lions is all about. The Lions is a coming together of 35 players and working out which the best combinations are. So I really felt that that 2005 just it it, it almost was the ruination of of the Lions and. Four years later, Ian McGeechan came back as head coach to South Africa, and he very much got the squad back on as a one squad. And you but know, they were very the, close to. What was the thinking behind Clive's um, kind of strategy? Because I mean, he was right in one way, wasn't he? I mean, the number of times you have to fly players out to join the squad because of injury and such like, and he quite reasonably seemed to think, well, if you're going to do that, let's take them with us, and then we don't have to worry about all that. Yeah, that's fine in theory, but what happened was he still flew people out when they were injured as well. So they started off with about 10 extra people than they, they might otherwise have, have needed. But I noticed Sir Clive know, isn't in the book, is it? Is he Did, not in the there? book, Sir Clive? <laughs> no, no. I didn't speak to him. How <laughs> funny, funny that. And, and what happened then? Do, do you think, I mean, that was the closest you think the Lions came to perhaps? Well, not really, but... You know, I think it needed a, a real um, sort of revision of, of what was important about the Lions. And, you know, I think we're at a crossroads now with the Lions. It's, it's you know, as someone who has, has been there, and, and I, as I keep saying, there's not many opportunities that you have to change the course of your life in many respects within a few short weeks. And, you know, I'm an avid golfer and, and you know, a golfer winning or being part of a Ryder Cup winning side or winning a, a major, within four days, that person's life can change forever. And in many respects, the, the same applies for a Lions tour. And you're lucky enough to go on the Lions tour. And, and in a matter of a few short weeks, you, you can come back and you, know, you can hold that and have that. Not that you get a tangible reward or, or you don't hold a trophy aloft. It's... it's it's mythical in many respects. It's like winning the Grand Slam when we won the Grand Slam in, in 1990. We didn't get a trophy for doing it. it just, but we have that thing to take us through our lives. And, and being part of a winning Lions tour is, is very much along the same lines. And, um, and I think that that ultimately is within a few short weeks you have this opportunity to create history and to you know just have that carried with you mm. for the rest of your life and it's quite it's quite a cool thing to do absolutely absolutely but i mean we've talked about this the, you know the roots being uh, amateurism and and old school i, I prefer to do it but and the, how has the impact of the professional game kind of affected you talk about this last tour and i, I just wondered if it's becoming the professionalism is becoming so based on the need to win that it's it's another threat to perhaps what the Lions represent. Well, I think, yeah, I think the South Africans took it to... Is there any South Africans in the room? <laughs> okay, lucky. <laughs> uh, we have, no, um, it's amazing where you find South Africans. They're all over the world, actually. They normally wear their Springbok jersey and uh, they're always very passionate. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think they took it to 
extreme uh, extremes on this particular alliance tour. They were so desperate to win. Um, but it was an extraordinary tour, and, and I think if, if anything has brought it home to me, and I, I was asking some people the other day that were at the tour, uh, on the tour, there was a squad of 82 people, a, a, a bubble of 82 people. They got tested the whole time. And if, if we were playing in the same position as hookers or scrum halves, we wouldn't be able to sit as close as this. You would be there and I would be at the other end. You, the, the scrum halves, the hookers, the props, they didn't eat together, they didn't travel together. The only time they, they made contact with each other was when they trained. Because if, if say, I went down with, with COVID, you know, you would have to be identified as a close contact and suddenly there'd be no scrum halves to, to play in the game. So I think people didn't understand just what the, the players and the management and everybody else had to go through in order for these games to be played. And, you know, for me, it was, it was a sort of non-event. It, 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 it's like, I, mean, I just wish it, it Yeah, had, it was a boring rugby and then you had the Razzie Erasmus business. Yeah, um, yeah and Razzie, I'd, I'd watched, I don't know if anyone had watched on, on Sky, I think it was, the, the, the route to South Africa winning the World Cup. And it was, it was an extraordinary programme. And, um, and yet they really seemed to let themselves down. I think the Lions very much had the moral high ground and... I think Gatland was was exceptional in, in the way that he he coped with it. But you know, when all was said and done, and all the sacrifices that the players and everybody in that bubble of eighty-two or three people, they made such sacrifices to be there. And you know, I asked, was it worth it? And I'm not convinced it was worth it. The the end result would have justified the means, but they should have won. They they were they won the first test and they. But isn't that the exactly what Razzie Erasmus would say to you? You know, here's a man who spent an hour on social media yeah. ranting about decisions. Well, he will say the end. He would say the ends justify the means. Correct. They won. Yeah, but it was tantamount to cheating. I would suggest that's why it's a shame there's not a South African here that I could have a right go at and, and basically try and make them feel quite guilty about the fact that there are a bunch of cheating bastards. <laughs> I'm quite glad I just there's no I would say that. Of <laughs> Sorry for swearing if anyone, but you know. Well, I think it reflects the, the, the strength of feeling. But, uh, but well, you know, you just watched the game. I watched the, the game yesterday between South Africa and New Zealand, and it was a brilliant game of rugby, and it was a brilliant game of rugby, and it bears no relation to the rugby that they played during the summer. And it, it almost was like they, the most important thing that they had to achieve was winning two games out of three against the Lions. And, and it didn't matter how they achieved it as long as they achieved it. And with the Lions, it's, it's not quite that life and death moment. It's brilliant. When, and, but I think, a bit like the Ryder Cup last weekend, that there was something missing as far as the Lions were concerned. And guess what that was? They're, they're called supporters. They are the heart and soul of what the Lions stands for and represents. And... and you know, um, it's 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 such a powerful, you know, thing to be part of, and and you know, for for non, for people that that don't get a chance to go and and be on the field of play, this is the next best thing. You know, you're right there. You're wearing the shirt. You're you're just so focused on that team's performance, and and you know, clearly. Um, that was a missing mm. factor, I think. I'm going yeah. to open uh, the, the debate out to get some questions in a second, but just, on the, just to finish that point, I wonder if you felt that what the real threat to, to, to Lions to a, that's just gone was not so much, as you put it, the alleged cheating uh, of... Did of I say that? I don't know. I can't remember now. Oh, please um, or was it the fact that the, the rugby was just dull? in the end, and both sides have to yeah. take, take responsibility for that, don't they? Well, they do. Um, and, I, and I think that that's, uh, you know, again, speaking to Gregor Townsend and Steve Tandy, I think that that would be their frustration that they were not able, perhaps, to, to quite express themselves. And for whatever the reasons that were, uh, you know, I don't pretend to know. Um, maybe it'll come out in someone's book in, in a few weeks or months time <laughs> I've not got a book oh. coming out by the way no no there's no <laughs> hidden there's no hidden agenda there um I just think they didn't play great rugby and 
I think they were caught between trying to win without playing great rugby. Sometimes, you know, you're, 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 more, you're more afraid of losing than, than actually of winning. And it was almost as though the Lions were trying not to lose as opposed to trying mm. to win. And yet, as soon as Finn Russell comes on, it kind of transformed the performance, I think. And I, I thought Finn was absolutely outstanding. So, on a brighter note, from a Scottish perspective, I mean, I'm pretty excited about what the, the, the next holds. season... Well, yeah, the next season holds for, for Scotland. And, um, you know, um, good. that would be good. Well, let's, let's have any questions from the audience. I'm sure there must be one or two. Any questions? <laughs> come on, no, don't please, be come shy. On. There's one down the front here, please. Thank you. You're getting a microphone. Yes. You're not South African, are oh, you? Oh, you've got to put your mask on. <laughs> yeah. Don't talk. Um, I just wondered what uh, rule changes you'd potentially oh. make to the game oh my. Oh going my God. forward. <laughs> That's a bit technical, isn't well, it? You, you, the Lions tour was a bit of a dour affair, and you know how do we get away from just having um, the biggest team and the strongest team out muscling the other team? Can, yeah. we get, can we get it back to a more skillful game? Well, I mean, I don't know if you watched the the. Um, South Africa New Zealand game yesterday, but I thought. Step away from hey, the loudspeaker. <laughs> Gosh. Well, that's woken everybody up, hasn't it? I hope I didn't send you all to sleep. Um, well, I've, I've got lots of theories about rugby, and I've got lots of theories about, um, you know, the way that the game uh, should be played. But I mean, I've always said that. Um, Rugby players are bigger, stronger, faster, fitter than ever before. You have the ability now to change over half your team at any point in the game, and yet the size of the pitch has remained the same. And I don't know why someone doesn't consider um, playing in a bigger rugby field. I would imagine if rugby was played on an Aussie rules pitch, I think it would be an extraordinary game, genuinely, and just go and take New Zealand play Australia and go and play it on, in the Melbourne cricket ground and, and see what it's like. And I think it would be amazing. And someone like Finn Russell would, it would be manna from heaven as far as Finn Russell's concerned. So you could do all that because let's face it, everyone would be blowing out their backsides after about 10 minutes because they're having to cover about half as much or no, more than half mm. as much. Um, replacements, I mean, Changing over half your team is just madness. And, and what happens now is that all these front row guys are coming on and they're coming on for 20 minutes and they're maybe playing against someone who's been on for 60 minutes and they're going to absolutely crucify. So I would suggest that no replacements can be made in, let's say, the 15 minutes, either the 15 minutes of, from the first half or maybe even halfway through the second half. And if you have an injured to, player... To the end. To the end, yeah. yeah. And, and if you have an injured player, So that's tough. your team, you finish That's with your them. team. And, and so, you know, and if a player gets injured, well, it's tough luck, isn't it, you know? Mm. Um, because I mean, otherwise we'll have bloodgate and we'll have all sorts of things. So I think rugby has always been very technical with its laws. And, I mean, I'm sure we don't want to spend 10 minutes talking. I, I, no, I don't. I don't know enough about some of the laws. So I would say, let's try and reduce the amount of subs and replacements that come on and maybe try and expand the, the size of the pitch. I think it would be quite mm. good. And, um, and what's your you thought, know. your take on the concussion thing? Because you famously scored uh, a try and it's quite clear you don't, don't remember. remember anything about no, it. Still don't. Well, <laughs> it was a good one, I'm told. Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> I mean, uh, what's your view on, on that? Because concussion is now being no, taken it is. very seriously. It, it, of of course it is, and quite rightly so. And, and, um, but you have to remember that, that these players at the highest level, I mean, they're, they're, they're fully conditioned athletes. Their, their physical fitness is extraordinary. And, you know, they, they get the very best medical treatment and whatever else. It's the... It's the kids that are playing at school, or school level and, and many rugby clubs, boys and girls, that, you know, you're not going to get the same level of, of attention medically as you would do at the highest level. So, yes, you have... It's right, but, you know, no one's forcing anyone to play, play rugby, but it's a wonderful sport. And for the mums out there, you know, 
the people say you've got more chance of, of you know, getting injured or whatever crossing a, a street. So, you know, I think we all have to keep things in perspective. And um, there's a lot of people playing sport. And I wish I actually had a, a thing about um, what rugby... Someone sent me a, a, a bit of a, a letter about rugby players and boys and girls, and, and it's wonderful. I might, if I find it, you carry on. No. I might look. <laughs> I might look have for it. Have we got another it question? First of all, anyone? Yes, one couple here. Start there, and I'll we'll come back I to you. Sir. Find this. D no, there's, oh, okay, there's one just here first, and then we can go up to the, the corner. Hi, Gav. In 1999, I was forced or thrust upon as a young leader to pick a leader that inspired me and produce a play. So, having seen Living with the Lions, I knew nothing about rugby, but that inspired me to call Ian McGeekin and produce a play in Ian McGeekin. And he was really, really a, a great guy. He came time out for a cold call in Northampton and came time with me. So, I'd like to ask you, similar to what I asked him, what is your attributes as a leader yourself, having led many things through your life, and what do you look for in leadership? Is the play out, by the way? Did you do it? Good man, I'll see you afterwards. Um, <laughs> you know, for, for me, um, talking about, I, I guess, looking back at my Lions experience, and, and I try and rationalize it, and I try and wonder whether if I, as a leader, had done anything differently, could we have had success in 1993? Um, and if I park that just, just now, I remember you know, over the, the, within the last number of years, I've had guys that I used to captain in the Scotland team and, and guys who I respect as rugby players and they've come up to me and they said, you know what, you, I just want to say that you were one of the best captain that, that I played under. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And, and that was clearly just unannounced and, and, you know, people just in a social occasion. And, and I think what I always tried to do as, as a leader was just get to know my players, really, and, and spend time with them. And, and because, you know, the way I thought about things was that when you are in the heat of battle and, and, and whatever else, that you just, you, you, when you need to inspire people uh, or, or get them to, to work with you, and, and it's much easier if you've actually spent time rather than, than looking at you and thinking you're a bit of an idiot and you never spent time with me. Why would I bother my backside to, to, to work hard to try and have a victory? And, so even if know, it's someone that you, you, instinct tells you, I'm not, I'm not going to like this guy, whatever, you make that effort to get Of course you do. That. Well, you have to because, you know, you're playing. And, and Jeremy Guska makes a, a comment in, in, in the book. And, and basically, when you're on tour with the Lions, you have to give everything you have to give all of your knowledge and all of your 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 skills and and just lay it out on the table and and basically i suppose you know just give give a few all and say this is for sharing i am prepared to share everything for the the good of the lions and and you know that's i i think what i try to do as as a leader is to to just give my all and, and to train as hard as anybody else to, you know, just show common sense when common sense was, was the most important thing to do. And just communicate. Communicate is, communication is the key to everything. And, uh, you know, so I guess that, as, you know, some might say that, that that's, that's what my main attributes were. I hope I've answered the question. I don't know if I have sure. or not, but, um, you know, I am what I am. And I'll tell you one other thing that, that you know, I, I know I'm true to myself, right? When I see this face looking back at me from the mirror, I know that I'm 100% true. Man. I, I'm true to myself and, you know, I'm not trying to cheat myself. I'm not trying to be someone that I'm not. And uh, that's, it gives me self-confidence. I think there's a question up on there. Gavin, uh, how long did it take you to get over what I would call your greatest FFS moment? 
30, <laughs> 30 years ago, lining up to, to kick a penalty against England in a World Cup semi final. Yeah, thank, that, thanks that, for that. that you missed. <laughs> <laughs> How, you think It'll I'm be... over that, do you? <laughs> How long did I take to get over that? I'll tell you a quick story about that. So it was semi-final. I, and Jim Hamilton, who some of you will know, he, um, in social media, he got me to watch that um, miss kick uh, about two or three years ago. And he paid me some money to do it, so I accepted. It was the only <laughs> way I was going to do it. And... Um, what people will not know is that the, the, the penalty was caused by Mick Skinner basically high tackling me. And I was down for a bit days, and Mick Skinner was a, a big bloke. And I was down in days for, and there was probably a period of about three or four minutes between the penalty being awarded and actually the, tick, the kick taking place. And obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, I should never have taken the kick, and Craig Chalmers should have taken the kick. And I always say I saw, when I looked up and, and placed the ball, I saw three sets of posts. <laughs> and I aimed for the right-hand set, and it went straight through the middle, but it should have been the left-hand <laughs> set, right? Um, but I, I, I remember coming into the change room, and, and we were in the change room afterwards, and not a word was spoken. <laughs> and there was a guy, Duncan Patterson, from Gala Shields, Gala Rugby Club, and he was our manager at the time. And he came into the change room, he said, guys, come on, we've got to pick ourselves up. Our World Cup dream's over. But, you know, it, it just, we've got to pick ourselves up. He says, remember Culloden. <laughs> now, Culloden wasn't a great day in the annals of, <laughs> of Scottish history. And Finlay, Finlay Calder piped up. He says, aye, donkey. But after Culloden, we didn't have to shower change and go and have dinner with the <laughs> bastards. <laughs> so... Anyway, thanks for reminding me of that. Anyway, I'm not seeing you afterwards. <laughs> Any other questions at all? So I've got, oh, there's one. We'll come down to the front and then back up. Thank you. Do, do that one. Do, okay. We'll get to you, Ivy. Don't, don't touch the microphone. <laughs> um, thank you. I was interested in your building a team. Do you have the 15 best individuals in their position? Or do you take other factors into account vis-a-vis -vis the Lions team, for example? Um, yes, I think... I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean... What was the old rat rule you told me about? I can't see Yes, that. you can. Go on. Well, the, a, no, the, the All Blacks had, had basically a rule that, you know, when you've got... When you go to the other side of the world with 35 players, right... It's one thing picking these players um, based on what you've seen playing for their own club side, their, their district side, or, or their country. But you never know what they're going to be like on the other side of the world when you're in Southland in, in New Zealand and it's pissing down with rain, it's freezing cold, the bloke's maybe been injured, he's homesick, He's missing his sheep if he's a Welshman. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, that's that all these sort of things, the factors taken into account. So you never really know. And I think back to 93, and you probably would have left four or five guys at home. But, and you never know. Now, were they the best players? No, they weren't the best players. But they're the players that are going to be the next best players that are playing in the midweek side that you want to be winning so that to keep the pressure on the Saturday side, but that doesn't come happen. Come on, what's the rule? Will you come shush? On, come on, come I'll on, get what's to, the I'll rule? I'll get to it. The All, <laughs> the All Blacks have a rule called, it's basically a no dickhead policy, right? And, and so they, if anyone is a complete pain, and Clive Woodward, to be fair, talked about that, that sometimes people, they, take so, they suck so much energy from you because they're a pain in the backside. And you have to worry about you know, almost keeping them or what's coming from that person next. And so I know for a fact that there were a couple of players that probably didn't go on this, this tour because they were not considered suitable because of the unique circumstances of COVID and the fact that they were not going to be able to go out, they were having to remain in the bubble. So these people were... Now, I don't know who they were as individuals, but I know that that sort of factor... So back then... Possibly 
players wouldn't be as well known as they are now and you don't have as many stats and, and whatever else. So I guess that that's, that's the situation that we're talking about. And, um, you know, it's difficult. It is difficult because when you're playing in your own country and you're at home every night and you're with your partner and you've got your kids there, it's a completely different proposition to being away from home for six or seven weeks mm. and, um, and not knowing how they react and, and whatever. And, you know, maybe Will Carling was a wee bit like that in the 93 Lions tour that, you know, he, he just wasn't just firing on all cylinders and, and he eventually came onto, uh, onto a very good game. And, but in, in the ideal world, you would have wanted Will Carling playing the very best rugby of his career on that tour in 93. And unfortunately, he wasn't because of circumstances that I don't know and, and I wasn't in control of. But, you mm. know, if you can get your best players playing the majority of the time, you're going to have a good chance of winning. But if your best players aren't performing, look at the Ryder Cup last week. Our best players in Europe were not performing compared to the Americans. And, and it's going to be difficult to win. So mm. it's not rocket science. You just wanted to try and prepare and, and do things to the best of your ability. I think there was a question down here if we can... You said earlier about uh, the one thing that was missing from the most recent tour was the supporters. So I was wondering what you think about the kind of over-commercialisation of the whole thing now that it seems fairly difficult to get tickets. Like the 93 tour, we were able to pick up tickets very easily at, uh, at stadiums, no problem. But now it seems that you need to be in a, an organised tour to actually get tickets or anything like that. And it just seems to be taken away from like a rank and file supporters a wee bit, and that it's uh, if you're not in these tours, you're not going to see the games. Yeah, um, it's it's difficult, but it's supply and demand basically. I think the one thing that they've done this year for the first time ever is there's been a joint venture arrangement between the British and Irish Lions and the host union, obviously South Africa in this case. And in the past, the, you know, they've done their own sponsorships and whatever else. And there's obviously a lot more value up here in the Northern Hemisphere. And, and so I think that maybe things will change uh, um, for the better in, in the future. And maybe there might be more access to tickets moving forward. Um, but I think by and large, yes, you're going to have to go on an organized tour and whatever else. But if you're paying slightly more, for that, conversely, if you've got friends or relations in whichever in Australia, for example, in four years' time, I would still be inclined to go there and visit your friends and relations and go along and, and get some tickets off the scalpers outside. And it's supply and demand at the end of the day. And if you're saving a few quid in your hotel and travel packages, well, you can spend a wee bit more on the tickets. Or else give me a call. <laughs> Sad, sadly, I think uh, the march of time is, is once again uh, beating us. But there's been plenty of other opportunities to ask Gavin a question, of course, at the book signing afterwards, which is just behind us. So don't forget, if you want a copy of the book and have a natter with Gavin, he'll be there. But in the meantime, I just wanted to, first of all, thank uh, Ivy Fisher and Rebecca Giblin for uh, the support uh, for this particular event. And thank you for all uh, coming along and making it such an enjoyable event. Thank you very much indeed. And most importantly, of course, uh, is to thank our guest, Gavin Hastings. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was good. Thank you very much. Amazing how quickly an hour goes. Thank you very much. I'm not sure, does the one-way system work?